Just make sure my devices are turned off because that's always awkward. <laughs> also possibly getting my reading glasses out. <laughs> oh yeah, clock gets wrong. We don't have that much time. No, we don't. Do not have an agenda for this, I don't think. Okay. Pardon? No. You want to borrow that one? Just so I know what I'm reading in. Thank you. I know. Um, Cheryl. Cheryl. That's for the one o'clock, isn't it? Okay, thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Call this workshop to order for the Metro Forecasting Models Interactive Growth Model. Um, do we have anyone to give the invocation? Would anybody like to give, would you like to, Diana? And uh, if you'll stand and join us if you'd like to, and also we'll follow with the Pledge of Allegiance. Bow your heads, please. Father in heaven, thank you for this day that you've blessed us with. I thank you for those that have come to hear our workshops today and for those that have come to present them. I pray that you give us all, including them, wisdom 
um, eloquence and speech, kindness to one another. Uh, Lord, give us your wisdom and your discernment in what we have to do today. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, take it away. Chair? Yes? What? Would you like a roll call? Oh, yes, I would like a roll call. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. My brain will show up at some point. <laughs> this is a public workshop of the Citrus County Board of County Commissioners this 9th day of April, 2024. And attendants are Chair Holly Davis, First Vice Chair Rebecca Bays, Second Vice Chair Diana Finnegan, Commissioners Jeff Knard and Ruthie Schlebaugh, County Administrator Steve Howard, and County Attorney Denise A. diamond Line. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, um, B1, interactive growth model. I believe you're up. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to start for a minute if you I are? could. You uh, absolutely, Steve. Go I, ahead. I will tell you, I, I'm glad that David's here today uh, with us. It, it's an impressive what uh, they've been able to accomplish, uh, Metro forecasting, whether it was in Auburn, Alabama, uh, where they actually provided the framework uh, for the city's award-winning comp plan. Um, also, uh, Charlotte County just recently submitted for a national award. And I'm just going to read what the, the chairman there uh, that I got a copy of. And it says, not only does the interactive growth model provide accurate insights into when and where development is likely to occur, it serves as a vital budgeting tool as tax dollars are prioritized at the local level. The information provided also helps with requests for funding from both the state and national levels as well. Um, also, uh, Florida Business Observer um, says this is as close to a crystal ball as it can get. So it's pretty interesting with... Uh, the ability that they have, so I'm excited to have them here. I will tell you, I was on a personal note traveling uh, for Easter to, to visit my mom a few hours away, and I picked up the local newspaper there, and guess what it said? It talked about growth. And as I was driving down their main section to get to my mom's house, guess what I seen? Storage units going up. I seen um, car washes. Um, I seen congestion of roads. So what we're facing here in this county is not unique uh, to this government, um, but with this kind of proactive tool, I think it's going to take this county really, really far. So I'm excited to have David here. But th there's a lot of things they've done in other counties within Florida and outside of Florida. So thank you for being here today to talk about this proactive approach uh, that instead of a reactive model. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Can you hear me now? There we I go. can. For the record, my name is David Farmer. I'm the CEO of Metro Forecasting Models. And I'm happy to be here today. I should have bought my better glasses. <laughs> Little screen here in front of me. Uh, is my hot? Ah, there we go. So my name is David Farmer. Uh, my background is I'm a licensed professional engineer, a certified professional land planner, and I have a master's in public administration where my capstone project was on studying policies uh, that promote fiscal neutrality. Yeah, I'm, I'm the guy that gets invited to all those good fun parties. <laughs> <laughs> I'm standing on the shoulders, though, of my partner, Dr. Paul Van Buskirk. Uh, he, uh, Paul became a city manager when he was in his early 20s, uh, back in the 60s, and he soon realized, this is in upstate New York, soon realized they didn't have the data that he needed to make intelligent decisions, even back then, to spend millions of dollars on infrastructure, schools, parks, fire stations. And so when he left being a city manager after about eight years, he started working on what is today the interactive growth model. Right? It wasn't all hatched in one day. It took 40 years of development through that process. And he has forecasted a lot of things around Florida, and I'll share some of those things with you. And that's the backbone of our, our basis. I'll skip that. OK, so interactive growth model. What is this thing? Well, it's a complex uh, series of algorithms. It's over. 500,000 lines of code, not that that matters. It's all it's custom software. This is not spreadsheet based. Uh, we use data from as many data sources as we can get our hands on. Uh, the, the foundation is parcel data, but then we load other layers on top of it, address points, uh, um, uh, various government layers, census layers, so we can look at incomes, we can look at uh, uh, detailed, very detailed dem demographics and that sort of thing. When we're running the model up, once it's all up and, and going, it demonstrates accurately when and where development is likely to occur by single family, multifamily, uh, office, retail, government uses. We forecast all those various things. 
what you're doing is you're, when you get the interactive growth model, you have a, a way to make data-driven decisions. And the, the first thing we do is we establish what we call your baseline. Where are you today? You might think, not that you don't know where you are, but we measure, we count every single housing in. I mean, every single trailer, uh, single family, duplex, triplex, quadplex, we classify all those things. We need to know what you have, where you have it. And we sort of take your DNA. We want to measure what's normal for citrus because while we work all over the place, and when I, I can make some very general statements, every place has its own thing. And so we're, our, our process is we're trying to uncover what makes you citrus and what, what are your needs and what might you be deficient in or what might you have too much of that we can help maybe balance out both the economy and uh, your land uses. Uh, it systematically evaluates the growth um, using granular um, spatial analysis, we use TAZs, that's traffic analysis zones. Your MPOs, uh, DOT creates these things. Uh, they range in size between maybe a block to thousands of acres, depending upon how many people are in the area. If there's not many people, then these traffic analysis zones, there's not a lot of cars, they're very large. Like, they can be 20 miles. Uh, in areas that are densely populated, these TAZs can be just one, one city block. So we use these TAZs to help aggregate spatially the data before we, we run the model and do the forecasting. Uh, some of our recent clients, uh, as the city uh, county manager pointed out, we Charlotte County, we're, we're still working there. In fact, we're starting to do a, a baseline update for them. We just started work for them in May of last year. Uh, Manatee County, I've been a client for a long time. The city of Cape Coral uh, since the early 2000s. Uh, Lee County, Lee County MPO, Lee County Public Utilities as well, Cape Coral Utilities. The city of Auburn, we've worked for the city. We've also worked for their school district there. Collier County, we've worked for many of their different departments. Uh, Sarasota County, uh, again, uh, Martin County and uh, Manatee County and the city of St. Cloud. Just some of the places that we've worked. And this is just over the last about, uh, about three years. So we try to get around and work for a lot of different places. You know, when you look at planning, people talk about planning as this one thing, but really planning is a toolbox. And uh, what I think what makes our company unique is we're working in so many different areas uh, that we're seeing how different areas are approaching maybe the same problem but differently, and we can help bring a toolbox instead of a single solution, the, the various techniques we've seen that work in other locations that might be applicable here. Again, once we study you and analyze you, I don't know what the solutions are today. It's sort of like a doctor. We have to come in and, and take a look under the hood and see what's going on and, um, again, try to identify things that are uh, maybe, again, there's too much of something or too little of something else. We also apply precise uh, spatial demographics. Uh, we believe you have, uh, I think, over 100 block groups, uh, and so we can have at least at least 100 different demographics around the county. So your areas that are more seasonal are, are going to show up as more seasonal. Your areas that are more family oriented that shows up in the data too. We can uh, we can work with your school board. We can also model your school age children uh, to understand how your enrollment might be changing, increasing, decreasing, or uh, or whatnot. So the goal here is that when we're done doing the baseline, taking your temperature where you are today, and then doing a build-out analysis, we can do proactive planning as we can see in the future, five years in the future, 10, 20, 30 years from now, what you're gonna need and where you're gonna be needing it. A quick example is in Collier County in 2017 when we updated their model. At that point, they were gonna need an elementary school every five years for the next 35 years. They didn't know that before we ran our model. I think of how much money and, and thought it, it goes into that. You're talking about um, probably close to what, about $3 billion worth of schools at, at $100 million a piece? It's a lot. Um, we, can, we can formulate policy or, more importantly, model your existing policies and tell you where you're going to be. The kind of cool thing about the models, it's taking, we're going to take every project that you've ever, or your, your uh, uh, prior colleagues have ever approved, and we're going to be modeling those all at one time, and the model tells us which areas are going to, be uh, impacted and come online more quickly or more slowly. I mean, you can see sort of, you know which projects you approve, but seeing how it all is going to develop at one time or, or through the lens of time, how it's going to be developing is going to be important factual data. You can see where areas that maybe are, uh, again, deficient for maybe commercial land uses. We want to put uses where they're needed, where they can be supported by the population. We don't want to put uses where they're not needed, right? That's a waste of, of taxpayer dollars. Uh, 
the model helps, the data from the model helps prioritize, again, the capital improvements, whether that might be transportation improvements or public facilities such as parks, schools, fire stations, that sort of thing. And also it protects the public interest by giving advance notice of these, these public impacts because we really can see it coming, right? Uh, one of our underlying major philosophies is that if we don't have any people, then we don't need anything. Right? It's only because of the, the residents we need parks, schools, fire stations, and as we need more people. Now, if we had one person, do we need more of those things? No, we don't. If we had 10, do we need more? No, we don't. But at some point, we're going to hit the tipping point where you're going to need more, and the model, again, identifies spatially when and where these things are going to be needed. So applications uh, for Citrus County, and this in, in some ways could be any county, you know, what areas are high growth for you? You, of course, know what areas have been hot maybe the last two, three, five years, but we can go back and, and measure uh, how quickly area, different areas of the county have developed, not by looking at your permitting, but by looking at actual COs. Mm -hmm. And we can pull that out of the uh, property appraiser data. And then again, as I was just, just mentioning, what are the collective impacts of all the projects that have ever been approved, and where can we assign land uses that are going to maybe minimize uh, the need to get in the car and drive? Can we, can we put a shopping center in a location that will, that will run, not require people to have to drive an extra 20, 30 miles? Is there a market to support it? The model answers those things. As developers are proposing projects, especially large-scale projects, are they allocating enough land for public uses? You know, if I don't know if you guys have any large 10,000 uh, um, uh, unit projects being proposed right now, uh, but certainly when you get to those sorts of scales, or even collectively three and four projects that add up to five or 10,000 units, when you start hitting on that many units, you're now talking about fire stations, parks, and schools, things that are needed from that. Are the developers setting, setting aside the land or reserving it? Uh, regardless of whether you can extract do an exaction during the zoning process, regardless of that, if the land is not reserved, then we don't have it, right? And in my business, vacant land, it's your money, it's your currency. And uh, a truism I like to say is you'll never have more vacant land than you have today. So today is the day to start planning so that we know that we have enough uses in the right locations, again, to balance out uh, the county and ensure that the, the right uses are in the right places to minimize unnecessary trips, minimize congestion, and create a high quality of life or maintain that high quality of life. We can also look at uh, uh, certain land uses. As, uh, as I was uh, driving in this morning, I was looking at uh, uh, some shopping centers that maybe have seen better days. And one of the tools that we have seen other counties do, and I'm not saying it's appropriate for you, but one of the tools is they've, they've allowed some multifamily uh, to absorb part of those shopping centers. And one of the ideal things about that, if you can achieve that, if it makes sense for you guys, is think about this. The roads are already in place. The signals are already in place. The water and sewer is already in place. All the impacts have been paid for through the, because when the shopping center was built, they paid their impact fees. Uh, you probably don't need any, any more schools because of, of this. But you can now add people uh, to a location that has, it's well served by things. It's, on, it's, it's well located. And yet, you're removing commercial that the market is screaming, hey, maybe we don't need this use in this location. So that's just one of the ideas that we can bring to you. We did an analysis, uh, albeit this is in Collier County. And I know, I know, it's Collier County. It's not here. But I think this will resonate. So the first Walmart in Collier County uh, was so successful it, it bought land across the street and moved from a, a shopping center into its own its own parcel. And what that did is over a 20 year very slow death, this, this whole 150,000 square foot uh, development just went into the doldrums. By 2010, it was only paying 100,000 a year in property taxes, albeit that's, that's you know, a lot of money, but, but considering that now today, the county has owned it for 330 units, they've torn down the shopping center that wasn't needed, they've added the, the, the residential, and they now have a vibrant uh, uh, restaurants out in front, so they've balanced out the economy, and now that same site is bringing in $1.3 million in property taxes. They don't have to raise taxes, they don't need to create new roads and parks and things because those things already exist in the location. Plus, we pulled off 100, over 100,000 square feet of commercial space that wasn't needed in that area anymore. Again, it might make sense for you, it might not, but these just one of the example of these tools that uh, we can bring to the table. <clears throat> and ideally, uh, what we're doing here is uh, the last two bullet points. Uh, we can look at what uh, the, la the land use is, uh, adding residential to commercial. And, uh, how, and by doing that, we can sometimes even reduce the need or reduce transportation congestion because, again, we're putting people closer to the uses, the things they need, and, uh, uh, and then reducing their need to drive. 
I know you know this, but we just want to bring it out and say, so a land use decision really is a traffic decision, right? Is that any, almost anything you do, uh, whether you approve a bank or a, a hundred homes, it's going to generate trips. And, uh, and, and if we do that artfully, hopefully, again, we can minimize unnecessary trips, reduce vehicle miles traveled, uh, right? So wouldn't it be better to drive two miles than 20 miles? Uh, and that other 18 miles we're saving not only re reduces wear and tear, excuse me, on the roads, but it reduces that congestion too. We don't, the key is we don't want to underestimate or overestimate. We're looking, we're looking to achieve Goldilocks uh, if we can. Uh, Bieber, do you guys know what Bieber is? So Bieber is the state's arm that does uh, forecasting. Uh, they're way cheaper than I am, they're free. <laughs> uh, 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 and, they're, and they're great, they do a great job. Uh, what they're gonna tell you, when we agree on the same number, then what they're gonna tell you is you're gonna grow by 100,000. I'm gonna tell you you're gonna grow by 100,000 and here's exactly where it's gonna happen. Bieber doesn't do the kind of analysis that we do. With that said, we often differ with what Bieber says because we do a build-out analysis, sort of when I was in college, uh, the seven habits of highly effective people. Uh, my favorite uh, was, I think it's the number three, uh, begin with the end in mind. And so we, we begin first with your baseline, but the second step is the beginning, is looking at your build out. Think about it in terms of Google Maps, right? You, uh, you put in a location where you're going, just like I did today, and Google Maps is gonna say, this is the most likely or most uh, efficient route to get from this point to this point. When we do your build out analysis, the model sort of is your Google Map, it's connecting the most likely path to get from where you are to where a build out is going to occur. Uh, to get into legal speak for just a second, our methodology has been rated as professionally acceptable by the uh, Department of Economic Opportunity. I think they've changed their name now. It's a different three-letter uh, initial. Uh, what that means is that uh, our data can be used in, in place of Bieber when you do a whole county uh, uh, for your comprehensive planning, long-range planning, and so forth. Let's see here. Uh, a couple, last slide about Bieber. <laughs> Actually, there might be one more. Uh, so Bieber, again, provides projections uh, for counties and estimates for Inverness. So I know we're in Inverness today. They do not forecast Inverness. They just say, well, this is what the current population is as of actually a year ago. April 1st of 2022 is the best they can tell you. We'll be able to tell you what the population of Inverness is as of about two months ago when we uh, run our model. Um, we can not only give you est uh, current year estimates uh, down to the penny, uh, but then we can then do our forecasting based on that and tell you in 2025, 30, 35, 40, and so forth. Um, because we're forecasting, we're, a we're analyzing all your vacant land and your policies, uh, we're striving to come up with your most realistic development outcome, right? There's some parcels that we have a good idea are gonna be strictly residential, some that are gonna strictly be commercial, but then there's those ones in between that could go either way. Even if your land uses today say, it's gonna be this. Well, based on the land uses you've already approved, we might say, well, okay, based on this, we have this, these, all these units coming online, they're gonna need some commercial space. Uh, even though this is a, maybe a future land use of ag, this is probably an ideal location for a neighborhood or a community shopping center, again, to put alloc allocate uses in the right location to minimize the need to drive out of that location. I lost my slide, there we go. Okay. So we didn't invent the method, which we did. It was invented by a, a Belgian mathematician, uh, I always get this wrong, but a, fr a Pierre Francis Verlemoust, and he forecasted the population of the United States in 1840, uh, what the 1940 population was gonna be, and he's off by 1%. How he did that without aerial photography, I have no idea, but uh, very impressive. Uh, my partner, Dr. Van Buskirk, was part of the uh, Northport uh, development back in the late 70s and early 80s, and he forecasted 25 years into the future, and he was only off by 102 people. We forecasted Cape Coral, that was the, uh, the article about the closest you can get as, as as close as you can get to a crystal ball, uh, with their population being 111,000 in 2002, and uh, and only being off by less than one percent. I also we also did work in 2016 for uh, the city. They've been a long-term client of ours. We forecasted the 2020, and we were off by less than one percent there. Um, that's interesting because we forecasted that in 2016, and not to pick on anyone, but Bieber gave a current year estimate that was off by four percent. <laughs> so. Um, we're forecasting the future, we're off by just a little bit their current year, again, because we use different methodology, and we, again, we go into great lengths, great detail to understand exactly what's on the ground. Not, uh, we don't, as we say in the office, we don't just download stuff from the internet, we wanna check and verify. 
uh, in fact, I was talking with uh, Hillsborough County. They were looking at some of our data for uh, North Manatee County. And they said, hey, you have less units than the census. And I go, well, let's, let's look at that. And we, we zoomed in on this one area, and uh, clearly there was, I don't know, let's say 100 homes. And uh, in the census said there was 150 homes. And well, clearly we know there's only 100, and so we started looking at the aerial photography. Well, it turns out there was an RV storage area, and I mean storage, where they're like six inches apart. And apparently the census had wound up counting those as housing units. Well, you, you know, I mean, you could live in them, but those were not occupied units at the time, and so we were able to say, we'll change the data, you know, you're the boss, we'll do whatever you want. But based on our professional um, uh, opinion, there's only X, there's only 100 here, there's not 200, and we should only be using that number for this. Again, the census does a great job when you think if they do the whole United States. Uh, but we have found areas, there's a, a, a block in Martin County, it's a single condominium, a single building, so there's not a lot of room for error here. The census is reporting 300 units and there's only 220. In, in that condominium itself. So we go, we don't just rely upon the census, we're actually digging in to try to find out what your housing units are so we can do the proper analysis. Uh, uh, the county manager already brought up that one, the closest you can get to the crystal ball. Uh, so uh, the, there's a lot of words here, I apologize for all these words, let us just tell you. So we look under the hood of Cape Coral and uh, Cape Coral is a pre-platted community. You don't suffer from that ailment, uh, thankfully, uh, because the problem with Cape Coral is they didn't have a lot of commercial land use uh, allocation. And the uses they did have was all the south end. So you have this, this city that someday is gonna be 300,000 people, and all of the residential was on one road, or all the commercial was on one road down at the south end. I mean, you have to drive, it take you an hour to get there from point A to point B. And so, what the model indicated back in the early 2000s is, hey, there's 23 locations where you really need to allocate commercial lands so that people drive shorter distances, have a higher quality of life, and more importantly, more importantly, remember this is 20 years ago, people know when they buy a house that there's gonna be a shopping center right there. What's the worst thing we can do to the public is, you know, you bought your house, it's next to a vacant single family lot, crazy you, you think you're gonna live next to a single family home and then some developer comes along, buys it up, and now it's a gas station, car wash, or something, something. If we allocate that land sooner, then at least the public is aware, I'm buying this lot, that's not a single family lot next to me, that's commercial and it could be something in the future, which I might not like, but at least I know that it's commercial today or it's gonna be commercial in the future and, and not a uh, residential use that I might find more favorable. So again, we wanna warn the public and uh, by doing this, uh, uh, they did 20, uh, uh, 23 comp plan amendments uh, to add these, uh, these shopping center areas and it has worked out well over the last uh, 20 years. In fact, we find they're still deficient in their commercial space. We just finished another analysis, and uh, they're actually falling behind. Their population is growing so fast that the commercial development can't keep up with uh, their population growth. So here's, I've got three slides here about Charlotte. So I'm not trying to say you're Charlotte, just to show examples. So the, the, the map up on the left is where we took uh, the county, and uh, after we analyzed the baseline uh, portion of it, we said, you know, how could we, how could we analyze, uh, let me drop back here. So there's 353 of these zones, right, TAZs, and if you try to look at 353 anything, it's a lot, it's a mess, you can't understand it. So we try to aggregate these in, in things that make sense. So one of the things is like Babcock Ranch, that's only a couple zones, but it's, it's a thing, and you guys have heard of that in, mm -hmm. in uh, Charlotte County, uh, a town that's sound by, uh, planned by Kitson Communities, it's gonna be 20,000 housing units, that's nothing to sneeze at. Um, so that's interesting. We have then uh, the mid area of, of uh, the Port Charlotte area that's just south of, uh, of the North Port area. And we have the West area and we have Punta Gorda and then the Burnt Store Road. And so we're able to analyze those and I'm gonna show you a slide here in a second where you can see what the, how the population's gonna change and what those needs are spatially. The graphic next to the map, uh, that shows where we went back in time uh, and we don't often do this, but we, need, we needed to do this for Charlotte because we wanted to understand what areas were em emerging, starting to grow. No, uh, uh, no surprise here, Babcock Ranch is one of the ones that's taking off like a rocket. And then, of course, Burnt Star Road uh, um, is also starting to take off. It's the one uh, next to that. And we look at the, the Punta Gorda area and we look at it, its, its building and it's sort of heading back down. Is it because no one wants to live there? No, because they're... Punta Gorda is approaching build out. They are doing some redevelopment, they are adding some additional multifamily, but Punta Gorda, uh, it's mostly already there. And so we can see these areas that are gonna be maintaining steady or changing a lot, and the areas that are gonna be changing in growth 
significantly. That's where we can now start looking at what is a mixture of land uses, again, to create uh, hopefully a har har harmonious and high quality of life. So here's why I said we break it down. I know this is ugly. Uh, I'm a number guy, uh, but you can see now, we can look at the bottom, look at the sums, and you can say, oh, by 2023, they're 201,834, and by 20, let's say by 2050, it's 329. Okay, so it's growing by 130,000 people. That's interesting, but now you can see, well, where is that growth really occurring? Well, um, most of it is actually occurring, looks like, uh, in the west and um, in, uh, uh, in the mid area, right? The mid area is going to almost double in population. And when you look at a map, that is not obvious. It looks like just a bunch of platted lots. It looks like you know Northport or, or North North uh, Port Charlotte. Um, but in fact, that area is getting ready to grow. So it's grown significantly, but it's getting ready to double in population. Well, what does that mean? It means they need to start identifying lands for, for parks and schools and fire stations. There's like four fire stations we were predicting they need in that area, and they, they don't have the land at this point in time. They're going to be acquiring those so they can meet the needs of the population. Hopefully, get that, get that land before it's driven up too much in value, right? Uh, it's a fine line between spending money too soon and investing in the future to, uh, to guarantee a, a future land use, again, because of that currency of being vacant land being important. And then the, the bullets on the bottom is just pointing out to their commission where it says 37% of the growth is going to be happening in that mid-cluster, mid and, uh, and that's just between now and 2030. So that's uh, significant for them. So some of our key findings, I don't have to read this whole thing to you. Uh, the things that I think are the most interesting is that, uh, so I'm gonna, it's gonna sound like I'm talking on both sides of my mouth. Today, Charlotte County doesn't have enough commercial uh, building area compared to its peers. We compared it against a bunch of different counties and it's deficient. Why? Because people are going to either Northport or, or going south into Lee County to get some of those needs met. Um, as So that means that like the burnt store road corridors is ideal now for adding close to a million square feet, at least, uh, least 600,000 square feet of commercial space to serve the residents, not only of, of southern uh, Charlotte County, but North Lee County too. There's, you know, on one hand, we work at political limits, but we, we look outside of those limits, too, because we want to understand if we think you need something and it's right across the street, well, we're not going to say that you need something that's literally right there. Uh, we want to understand what we're, what we're modeling. Um, so on one hand, they don't have enough commercial building area today, but on the flip side, at build-out, they have 750 acres too much allocated for commercial spaces. So it means some of the areas in, throughout the county have actually too much allocation of commercial space today Think of like the Punta Gorda area, uh, uh, the Port Charlotte, it's not Punta Gorda, the Port Charlotte Mall. There's a Dillard's there, they're getting ready to tear that down, add 250 units, and it's likely that they might add up to, and I'm not kidding, up to 1,200 units at where that mall is located today. They're not replacing the mall, they're gonna be augmenting it and turning it into a de facto mixed use community, just sort of a, uh, a different approach. People today want to build an excuse from nothing, but you can take these commercial areas, and like I said, in Port Charlotte, and, uh, and they're going to convert that to a, a mixed-use uh, sort of facility. So that's a point that now that, that, that's important because also compared to their peers, they have a, a reduced amount of industrial land allocation. So the good news is we have, we have too much commercial space in some areas, not enough industrial. Hey, here's a good idea. Why don't we balance and allocate some of those commercial lands that we know for a fact are not going to be needed and where they're not going to be needed and allocate those for industrial uses that not only help balance the tax base but give a place for our kids to work and employment centers and that sort of thing. If you want to read all the words, you can, but that's, that's the synopsis of it. Uh, so our signature begin starting point is population, right? Once we have population, we have more population, we need, there's a, comes a point in time we need more things, more facilities, more infrastructure. So we have submodels that help answer some of those questions, uh, commercial, industrial, fire stations, uh, utilities, uh, parks, schools, impervious area, and then we can, from there, we've even done custom analysis. I think the county manager talked about, we did an analysis for the Collier County Sheriff's Office, where, to the best of our knowledge, uh, we actually won an award for this. We tied land uses to CFS, calls for service, and in analyzing, I'll have to tell you that um, when I walked into that project, I'd like to think that I'm, I have an open mind, but I had some prejudice. Uh, I thought, well, certainly uh, everyone knows that multifamily has more crime, right, more calls for service. I'm telling you, after looking at five years of data, 
We didn't find that. It was it was simply amazing. Uh, we interviewed uh, many many of the of the uh, leadership in the in the sheriff's office, and uh, what we found was that actually uh, commercial, not just shoplifting, but commercial spaces were a leading indicator of call for, calls for service, and a lot of that was related to actually uh, traffic incidences. So uh, anyway. We tore that thing apart, did a huge study for them, identified where they were going to be needing their new sh substations. Again, uh, if you're familiar with Carter County, they have uh, there are 400,000 people a day. They have a vacant area called the Rural Land Stewardship Area, where they're going to be adding 300,000 people. So essentially, the population is going to be doubling. And out that area, there's no substations yet. And so the Carter County Sheriff's Office hasn't needed a new substation. Uh, probably in 40 years, and we forecast in the next three that they're going to be needing, and they're using our work now, and by 2030, they need to have their first one coming online in Ave Maria, and then they have another one coming online in 2045 uh, for that work we did. And that's an example of the custom type of analysis that we can do. Uh, so by using these, so you start with the interactive growth model, the, the signature population, and then we have the commercial submodel. I talked about the uh, city of Cape Coral, how we use that. The industrial submodel I've talked about in Charlotte County, how we were able to identify that against their peers, uh, they actually had, compared to, to Sarasota County and Lee County, they have half of the industrial allocation that those counties have, uh, meaning that Charlotte County, especially with the Punta Gorda Airport, can easily absorb more space if they can allocate the land for that. We have the fire station submodel. Uh, almost every county we work for uh, uses that to help identify the need for future stations. Uh, the utility submodel, we've worked for many cities and counties, I've done many, many master plans. Uh, well, we do the data for the master plans uh, to help understand how many millions of gallons a day of treatment and, and potable water you're going to be needing. Uh, the impervious model is excellent for understanding where your areas are likely to get more impervious, how rapidly your engineers can now use that, especially in areas like this that have topography, understanding where we're going to become more impervious so that we can plan effectively for the stormwater management. In, in, uh, when we ran the model for the city of Cape Coral, we found that in a uh, five-year period, they were going to be adding uh, almost 1,000 acres of impervious area to the city. Again, not all in one location, but see where, the, where those are going to be allocated uh, based on the, the predicted uh, development is useful for, again, accommodating stormwater uh, management and those sorts of things. I already talked about the law enforcement. We have a school submodel. Uh, we've done many school districts uh, to analyze their, uh, uh, their need for schools. Our methodology is uh, very different, again, it's based on the IGM. And then we do an analysis of what we call your school-aged children. So we can ask, because as you know, not every area of the county has the same concentration of, of children. We study all that to understand where, they're, where they live now and where they're likely to live in the future. And of course, a, par uh, a park submodel. Uh, the Naples Airport Authority, we're a part of their master plan team right now that's looking at possibly relocating an airport. Pretty cool job, never thought I would ever even be looking into that. It doesn't look like it's going to move, but we're analyzing four areas for them uh, and how the population might be changing and, and how they can maybe better plan for a, a future airport. The commercial submodel, basically what we're doing is we're measuring uh, what you have, your DNA, what's normal for you, and then we're going to give you some uh, data of, of comparisons of other counties and how you might compare in terms of when we say you don't have enough, we can point to these counties and say, see, they have different allocations of commercial space, and you can easily absorb more, and here's where you might want to allocate that space so that, again, we put the commercial in the right locations and don't add more to areas that maybe don't need them. We'll also point out to, uh, areas that are ideal for future neighborhood and community shopping centers. And I throw those terms out like everyone knows what I mean. And um, uh, when we say a neighborhood shopping center, uh, the simplest explanation is like a Publix, right? It's basically 100 to 120,000 square feet. And it has uh, the Publix with, or Winn-Dixie with the ancillary uses around it. A community shopping center is uh, an area that has probably two or three or four big boxes together. We have like a, a Lowe's, a Target, maybe a Walmart, and, and some other things. that. Uh, basically become sort of a destination area for your, your populations. We'll forecast when and where those are going to be needed, again, so you can check your allocations. Maybe you have plenty allocated, maybe you need more. Uh, the analysis will tell us uh, how that works out. Industrial. Uh, with industrial, uh, we, uh, we don't forecast warehouses versus public storage or, or whatever, uh, but we do allocate, uh, we do uh, analyze your existing industrial and, uh, and, and tell you where you stand, again, against the other counties around you and point out areas that maybe are deficient. This area could use maybe some more industrial space based on what we're seeing. And, and uh, if there's any uh, excess of space, we can, we can point that out as well, too. 
we don't often find an excess of industrial uh, land use uh, when we do our analysis for people, but sometimes. Again, we can t test the conversion of lands as needed, and we also forecast that employment that ensues from this non-residential uh, development as well. Uh, talk about the fire station sub model. We're trying to we do a drive time analysis so we can see where the coverage is of your existing stations. And again, we work with your fire department. We don't we don't take stuff from outside. We we come to you. Do you want a six minute uh, uh, response time, seven minute, five minute, whatever it is you guys want? We then run that analysis and then we say, okay, based on all of that, this is where we're going to have deficient services in the future, and so we can start planning for those future fire stations. The utility sub model again. We're so the Punta Gorda with their Punagord, I'm sorry. Uh, City of Cape Coral, uh, they're planning upwards of, uh, of $3 billion worth of uh, water and sewer improvements over the next few decades. And that, that prioritization is based on our forecasting work uh, from the model we did in, in uh, 2021 with AECOM. Uh, we've also worked for the City of Naples, City of Fort Myers, Collier County, uh, Cape Coral, uh, Lee County Utilities, and so forth. The park submodel. Uh, we look at your comprehensive plan, or uh, we need some sort of standard. The gold standard is 10 acres of recreational space per thousand. Uh, with that said, not a single client of ours has anything near that. Uh, I think our next poster child is actually Charlotte County, and they have, I think, six and a half acres of, of, uh, of uh, recreational space for every thousand uh, residents. That's an excellent standard. Carter County has about 4.1, to give it an example. Uh, so we help evaluate uh, based on either your level of service or we can su suggest a level of service uh, so you know when and where more park lands might be needed, including neighborhood parks, community, regional. If you don't want all those, you don't have to have them, but we can. if you have those standards, we can help forecast when and where those will be needed. School submodel, we forecast elementary, middle, high schools. And again, it's based on your DNA. It's a, uh, once we've run the interactive growth model, uh, it's not a heavy lift then to run the school model to analyze, again, where you have it, uh, existing capacities. Uh, and the model doesn't just say you need more schools. It uses your own capacities, the FISH standard. And uh, it's the Florida inventory of schoolhouses. Um, their capacity, so we don't over forecast your need. It's based on the existing capacities you have and then the future capacities when we build more elementary, middle, and highs. It gets all based on spatial demographics and, uh, and it's pretty accurate. Like the impervious model, I was telling you again, just forecast when and where you'd like to have more impervious area for a future uh, water planning. It's not a hydraulic model, it just indicates where we're going to have more uh, potential runoff. So collectively, you start taking these submodels, especially the industrial, the commercial, uh, and the population submodels, knowing when, where people are, where they're going to be showing up, uh, where there's going to be demands, and, and more importantly, unmet demands. Right? I have this, this population; it's growing. At some point, they're going to they're going to be able to support things. The model points these things out, and you can help show them uh, to developers that you where you want to see things happen. Right? So if someone comes to town, they want to build a some kind of shopping center or something, you can point to this model and say, here's the data that says that this is actually going to be needed, and, and when and where, so as a, another data source to back up. Um, I'm not here to uh, suggest, uh, let me say this carefully here. We don't want to pick a fight with anyone, uh, but our, uh, our data is what's known as substantial competent evidence. And it comes down to a, you hire us, we become your substantial competent evidence. And if our data doesn't show that commercial is needed in a certain location and someone wants to apply to change a land use, our model data can be used to say, well, our data says we, it's not needed and no, we're going to vote against this project. This is the reasoning why. The, the, the nexus is we, we have our data shows this. And unless your data can trump this data, show that it, doesn't, it, it shouldn't be followed, and we've never been trumped by anyone. Um, so. Anyway, it provides that, that uh, basis of saying no if you need to. It also gives you permission to say yes. If you know, the model's pointing something's needed, you can help rely on the model and say, well, our consultant says that we do need 200,000 square feet of allocation in this location, and that's why we want to approve this project, because in the end, we believe it's actually going to reduce traffic trips. It's going to reduce um, uh, congestion by putting this land use in this location to meet an, an unmet need. Uh, this is a fancy slide to say that, uh, yes, like everyone else, we brought AI into the office. Uh, we use a lot of GIS, and so uh, we came up with a way uh, to, uh, so land use and, and zoning, those are very important things. I don't want to think they're not important. But we, we thought it'd be cool if, well, what if, what if they didn't exist? 
what if, what if, if we could just look at every single parcel, vacant parcel, and say, well, what's around this? And based on what's around it, what would be the ideal thing in the middle of all that stuff? And so a simple example, uh, the way I came up talking to my son is I said, Nicholas, if the, if this, if the house next to us uh, burned down, what do you think would replace it? And he goes, a house, Dad. I go, well, okay, why'd you say that? Well, because we're surrounded by houses. Well, he's right, because we're surrounded by houses. There's easy things like that, but then there's areas where, well, is this going to be a house, or should it be a duplex, or should it be industrial, based on the uses around it? Uh, so we wrote these tools that go through and analyze every single parcel. Um, I don't know how long you would take. Uh, Lee County is about 600,000 parcels. It takes three hours to run these tools through it. But it color codes the, the vacant parcels for us. Again, we don't ignore zoning, don't exor ignore future land use. But this is a, yeah, another indicator of, OK, all things being equal, um, this might be a great location for some industrial. This might be a great location for some multifamily and such. So we're kind of proud of that. We also uh, we have a, a $20,000 subscription uh, to satellite imagery. We can see things as, as, as recent as yesterday. It's kind of scary. Uh, the good news is it's not high resolution, not overly high resolution. They're old Google satellites, but it's all we could afford. But we use that for building our baseline and build out databases to really understand, uh, again, what the uses are around you at the given time. Uh, Collier County is using this, and I don't know why that showed up that way, but I apologize. That's weird. There's a quote under there from uh, Commissioner McDaniels talking about that. Uh, you can just trust me. It says he likes the model. <laughs> I can get the actual <laughs> quote for you if you'd like. Um, one of the biggest things we did for Collier County, remember the RLSA, that 300,000 population I mentioned that build out? One of the problems is that's all we know is there's 300,000 people are going to show up. So we're going to, we know we're going to, we're going to need park schools and fire stations. And so uh, there's an allocation in the county system for that. But the county didn't have an allocation for commercial uh, office retail and industrial uses. And so they turned to us and we developed the methodology for to use force, forcing developers to allocate. When you, if you're going to come in with um, 8,000 units, then you need to allocate. There was a formula we came up with. You need to allocate this, these, this many square feet or this many acres of commercial entitlement so that we know that you're not going to be trying to drive all the way in uh, to coastal Carter County. It makes no sense to drive two hours into town when we can provide, not today, but you know, 300,000 people. We're going to be able to support two, two hospitals. There's, there's not even a 7-Eleven there now, right? Um, uh, that we're going to be able to support many, many neighborhood shopping centers, community shopping centers, schools, and all these things. And the, so the developers have to allocate the land up front. Otherwise, what's going to happen, the path of least resistance is plat that land, build a house, sell it off, move on, and now it's someone else's problem, right? It's the board's problem because uh, now you've got to build, you know, a small little $500 million road because there's no commercial uses, and I now have to get all these people on this double-decker, eight-lane road into an area where they can actually get their needs met. Or more simply, why don't we just force the developers to allocate the land that's needed so that we don't need to build uh, those uh, monster roads in many, many cases. Uh, so Martin County, we did actually a commercial and industrial land use analysis for them, and we helped to demonstrate they were getting um, a lot of applications for um, rezoning land. And uh, part of it, I don't want to put words in one's mouth. Well, you can just say the, the Live Local Act is sort of tied to that. You guys, I'm sure, have heard of Live Local, right, where we can now take commercial industrial lands and, and in theory, force a government to take whatever development we want to put down on it. So let's just say that Martin County is aware that that's a potential sort of a backdoor a way into allocating uh, residential land uses where maybe they aren't, aren't warranted. So we did a study for them analyzing their current uh, commercial and industrial needs. And we found that they had at least enough for the next 15 years if they didn't want to allocate something. Now, if they wanted to approve a zoning for a specific use because it was going to generate jobs or something, OK. But, but, uh, but not necessarily just allow a developer to come in and say, well, I just want to take this area right here, and I want, to, I want 100,000 square feet of commercial just you know, because. Uh, well, the model says that there's already enough land. We don't need any more commercially zoned land. Uh, let's reserve that and might actually be a better use for residential purposes. May I ask a question on clarification on that? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so since you brought up Live Local, that has not reached our shores yet, but Pasco County got horribly injured by it. So are you saying that you can help counties defend against that, or is? I, I, I want to say that. Well, so the, the legislature, I think, just amended the Live Local Act. Did they? And, and uh, I, I knew it was I, a foot, but I just read the legislature just came out of legislature. And if they already were applying under the 2023, then you have mm -hmm. to let them come through. But if they haven't applied, then they have to live up to the new 2024 standards. And it's much more government friendly. Um, I was just reading something on that um, through APA. 
maybe a week ago, there's a legislative report or something, and I was reading the analysis of the difference between that. What I'm pointing out is uh, because of Live, Live Local, where in theory, commercial lands can instantly be converted to a mm -hmm. residential land use uh, that, the, that Martin County doesn't want to necessarily just be converting uses to commercial and then not know what the future of that land is actually going to become. All right. Uh, with that said, uh, I want to be careful, but we do provide substantial competent evidence and both to um, encourage you to do certain zonings and the model data might say that that, that, that Zoning may not be in your best interest, not on a micro scale, we're not looking at 7-Elevens, but in this area, there's, not, there's already too much commercial, we don't need more commercial. Uh, or in this area, we actually do need more people, and if you, want, if you wanted to, you felt right about it, this is an area that might be ideal for more multifamily, again, mm -hmm. to uh, meet the needs. Okay? Great. Thank you. Uh, Kate Coral, we talked about the 23 comp plan amendments. Uh, and we we actually, uh, Kate Coral did a very interesting thing. In the, in the Great Recession, they did something very, very bold. They spent about $13 million of public money uh, buying an investment portfo portfolio of vacant land throughout the city. Uh, they needed, the funny thing is, uh, it was like 12,000 parcels. They needed like three of them for, for some future parks. Uh, but uh, the the current city manager, he was a, a, a director at that time, he said, are you crazy? We're not going to buy those three. Let's buy the whole kit and caboodle. They did. Um, and, um, and they've done very, very well. They now not only can control, since they literally own the land, they can control how that land is being used. They're also selling it off for a profit, right? They bought it at the, at the bottom of the market in, was it 2011 or 2012? And uh, now they're able to both control, because they own the land, control what, how that land is being used, but also uh, um, uh, uh, create capital, uh, generate capital with tax dollars uh, from that uh, very fortuitous acquisition back then. Now, one of the interesting things, too, about uh, Cape Coral, when we started with them, their build-up population was 400,000. And remember, I said they didn't have enough commercial. But when we, when we identified the areas that should be commercial, well, if I do commercial, I can't do residential. So you pull that use out of it. We found now that their, their build out is closer to about 340,000 people. So it actually came down because we raised the commercial allocation. Um, it's a, it, I think it's fascinating. It might be boring. But uh, just how build out can change based on policies and allocation uh, of densities and such. So why choose us? Uh, well, we have the knowledge, tools, experience. I, um, I love what I do for a living. Uh, I think I forgot to say this on the front end. We only work for government, so I'm intensely interested. You're, you're, you're my ideal client. Uh, we do not work for developers. Our best interests, uh, your best interest is always our, our best interest. Uh, uh, we're professionals at doing this. We do it all day, every day. We completed a project in the city of St. Cloud where we uh, analyzed their areas uh, uh, for fiscal um, balance, if they are going to be annexing, I know you're not annexing as a city or as a county, uh, but we analyzed their fiscal impacts from uh, certain land use changes they were uh, contemplating. And then, of course, in Collier County, the police and fire departments, we've been able to set up uh, their uh, faci future facilities for decades into the future so they know when and where they're going to be needing so they can uh, plan accordingly for that. Uh, we'd like to say that quality data leads to quality, de de quality decision making. And I probably talked too fast. And when I did, I just want you to know I love what I do, and I'm very excited. So I'm happy to answer any and all questions. That, um, it is obvious that you love what you do. It's, it's exciting. And um, I see what your point is, Mr. Howard, about crystal ball. Um, I have a list of questions. Does anyone else want to start, or do you want me to? Go ahead. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start. Thank you for being here, first of all, and great information. I've, I've been looking forward to this. Uh, have you had the experience of working, I guess, um, cooperatively with both a county and city government or city's government uh, at the same time on a project? I was having a conversation about this workshop recently, and um, uh, it was suggested that, that maybe if this is something that the cities in the county were interested in that this might be a golden opportunity to look at the entire county, including the cities, in developing this plan if we do go down this road. So let me, let me answer that question sort of in backwards. So in order for us to do our job, um, 
the best quality work, we would have to do your cities anyway. Uh, with that said, if you're not so interested in, say, this, the town of Inverness, we might go to less detail about uh, getting the actual boundary of it. Um, we have to cut those zones, so to speak, which part of, which part of zone one, two, three is in the and what part is out. We may not do that uh, level of detail, but we still need to understand uh, how the land in Inverness is gonna develop or not develop versus the land around it and the other cities and municipalities within, within the county. Um, to your other question, or to part, the part of that question, the closest, closest example that I can think of two is uh, both Collier County and Martin County. So in, in uh, Collier County, we have the city of Naples and, uh, and planning between those two, I think has been improved since, uh, since we've run our model. And then the city of uh, Stewart, uh, so the county bought the model for the whole county. And then actually the city of Stewart wound up, um, you guys follow this kind of stuff, but 3M, you guys know about 3M's problems? So the city of Stewart, their, their uh, water supply system was contaminated um, um, what's the word, allegedly, <laughs> by uh, the, the fire retardant foam. And so uh, the, the city turned to the county and said, hey, you, you know, who do you suggest? They met, you got these Metro, they were using some company out of California, it didn't go very well, so they hired us. We stepped in and collaboratively worked between the county and the city to understand this, the water service area for the city of Stewart, which was not, as you can imagine, exactly the city of Stewart. It's an amoeba that goes into the, into the unincorporated county and part of the unincorporated county uh, water service area goes into that, we were able to quantify exactly. And uh, so there's a small example of how a city and a county working together using our data uh, to help achieve something better for the public. I know it's not strong, but something. If I may piggyback on that question, um, school district. Mm -hmm. um, working, I, I noticed that you had a county and a school district, same, same county, yep. uh, both as clients. So how does that generally work? Are the models... Um, the submodels purchased separately, or how does that yeah, work? Yeah, each one of those. Yeah, because it's it's you know um, sort of like seize candy. Which chocolates do you want? You know, we need to we need to run the, the we need to run the, the population model first because everything em emanates from that. Mm -hmm. But if for some reason you didn't want the fire station model, but you did want the school model, that's those two are independent of each other. Uh, the school model is excellent for understanding where those future facilities are going to be needed and when. Uh, sometimes the information is not well received, uh, especially sometimes when a county, I don't want to shoot myself in the foot, but when a county hires me and I do the, I do the work uh, on behalf of the county for the school district, uh, I've had pushback sometimes where um, you, you don't understand, we don't need a school out there. Um, and then three years later, they're starting to build a school out there <laughs> where, right where we said it was going to be needed. Um, so um, we've worked for both. I don't know how to answer your question, I guess. Uh, no, I was just I, I was just curious about that those collaborative efforts because obviously that's a different funding source, et cetera. But um, right. I would say I, I think that our school district is pretty forward thinking and and uh, well regarded in terms of planning, so they might actually welcome additional input. So. Right. What we'd want to do is study like so that um, often uh, school sites vacant ones are coded as eighty threes, mm -hmm. and we go through the DOR codes and, and identify where they own vacant lands and maybe suggest where some additional vacant lands might be needed or not needed. Uh, there are areas in, uh, in Lee County where we're able to identify where, uh, actually the city of Cape Coral has plenty of sites uh, for, for future schools, whereas areas like Lehigh uh, don't have enough areas for schools. And we're able mm -hmm. to point out, you're gonna need three more elementary schools that you don't have sites for. Here's where we think they might be needed. Uh, we did that work back in 2019. Uh, we actually just did some new work for uh, um, the traffic people down in Lee County. And since then, the school board has picked up uh, three mega sites. Mega, I mean, they're going to put three uh, elementary, middle, and high on each one of these parcels because this Lehigh area was already pre-platted, didn't have land set aside, and so they were able to uh, gather those lands to meet the needs of the future population. Those kids won't show up for another 20 years, but if they don't buy the land today, it will be gone. Absolutely. Small example. Um, Ford, I have, I have, like I said, I have a list, but go ahead. Thank you. Since you did mention the Live Local Act, I, I quickly tried to look up the changes because um, you were saying commercial, and I was always, from the beginning, and especially uh, seeing what PASCO went through, uh, was concerned about our industrial lands. So mm -hmm. if we had extra industrial lands identified, 
in my head, I was thinking, how are we going to protect this? Because that seems to be what's turned over in the Live Local Act. I tried to pull it up real quick in case I missed something. I don't think I did. It's more government friendly, but I think to height of buildings, things like that, I think yes. they could still take industrial land. Uh, Citrus County, I believe, still has a lot of opportunity that could come here for better paying jobs and better paying industry. And I wouldn't want us selecting uh, certain industrial properties and labeling it as such so that could be ripe for the taking for something other than industry. So I didn't know if you had any tools in your toolbox to help us protect any identified lands for industry so it wouldn't be gobbled up in the future just by more housing under the Live Local Act. And if I may piggyback, because one of mine is very similar to that, so you can give one answer. We only have 0.6% of our land is um, commercial or light industrial. Okay. Well, you're likely to show a deficiency then yes. in terms of your So peers. we actually need, I completely concur with what she said, we need more high paying jobs in, in light industry. So um, please go ahead. Because wouldn't, that be, wouldn't that, that be the issue if we stuck with our 0.6% mm -hmm. and then by Live Local Act, they came in and took that. Yeah. I mean, we, we would be in trouble. I mean, for the future when we're talking about forecasting. Right, so that's in some respects more of a legal problem. I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to paint us as the, the, the you know, um, one pill solution. I mean, well, we, can work with your your council and and help strategize and and come up with mechanisms that would help protect things. Uh, I don't know what is legal and what is not in terms of. Um, uh, I've, I've had ideas about assessments, um, changing assessments, uh, using that as a mechanism to keep the land as a given land use. I don't know if that's legal or not. Just some things in my head that I've looked at that if you want to change, great. The, the, that's the, the, the assessment goes up by a factor of a 1,000, you know? And then it's basically a poison pill. Uh, but I don't have a magic solution right now. But I'd be happy to work with uh, your, your people. And, and uh, again, you, you probably don't have enough uh, industrial lands. But um, with that said, you still might have, in, in certain areas, more than maybe what you need. And you could give those up here to allocate more over there. I'm not saying you do. It's, again, it's part of our analysis process. Um, like at the Punta Gorda uh, Airport, uh, we were able to point out that they should retain all of it. In fact, there's, they're trying to remove or discourage land, uh, residential land uses right around the airport because they want more of that to go industrial. And that's, that's more of a likely a good compatible, compatible land use, right? Noisy airports and such. Um, uh, industrial is a perfect thing also to buffer air, uh, that, all that noise from, uh, uh, from the population itself. Bless you. But I, I, feel, uh, I feel the pain of when you have very little of something and you want to hold on to it, and yet uh, uh, state laws maybe don't necessarily give you all the protections that, that you want. Uh, for what it's worth, over about a year ago, I was at a, a conference, the one up in Jacksonville, the APA conference, and I was talking with, and I would name the law firm, I can't remember them right now, they're out of Tallahassee, and I said, hey, so what can you, what do you guys think about this live local? I said, well, here's what our clients are telling us, that uh, they want someone else to go first, because what's, what's going to be key is the first person that, that tries to force this down someone's throat is going to be a ton of litigation. It's going to be protracted for years before we know what that answer is going to be. And no one was um, uh, ready to, uh, to jump into that at that point in time. Now, that was September of last year, for what it's worth. It sounds like in Pasco County, some of that has been successful to convert things, uh, those uses. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> Commissioner Bays or Schleybaugh? Thank you, Mr. Farmer. I was really looking forward to this presentation, and you did not disappoint me. Um, I'm a numbers person, too, so okay, yay. <laughs> kind of could geek out with you. Let's talk data. Um, I used to say for many years that my bubble or my circle was very small. It was actually a five-mile, one-way trip, 10-mile loop, um, home, Publix, Drugstore, school, <laughs> home. <Yep. laughs> and, uh, you know, if I took, moved it the other direction, I could hit ballet and church. So um, I really appreciate you explaining that and, um, you know, solidifying that it reduces 
vehicle miles traveled on our roads if it is a convenient bubble or circle for our residents. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, how many car washes and storage units do we really need in our <laughs> bubble? I got a lot in my bubble right now. So I, I really appreciate that because um, the second thing I liked that you said that I wanted to say preach, could you say it one more time? The multi-family crime stats mm -hmm. and how that turned out once you dug in there wasn't really true. So I, I would love to have a, you know, dive down a little deeper in that and have some information on that because that is a big concern for the citizens here in Citrus County. Right. The final thought I had was, and you, I didn't think you would touch on it, but obviously you, your group is really impressive, but the future developments, you know, we're relying um, on our developers to say, okay, I'm gonna build, you know, in 30 years, we're gonna build 6,000 homes. And they're allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of say in that. But we're not gonna be relying if we had a company like you to say, for them to say, oh, you're gonna only need one fire station, one elementary school. Your, your data would say, no, actually, you're gonna need this. You're gonna need two of this instead of one of that. And I think that would be a huge tool in our toolbox. And I just, that alone would um, be very helpful for future boards. So thank you so much for coming today. And thank you for all this. I'll be rereading this and keep it in my drawer for reference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Bays, are you ready or you want me to go? Um, we, uh, a couple of other side notes. Um, so number one, we have uh, about 50% of our land can never be developed. So mm -hmm. I think we're gonna knock it out of the park on the reserved public lands for parks. <laughs> okay. But that's because we have large swaths of state forest as well as our own um, county parks. Is that, do you know if that's TIF land or? Just state or TIF? Well, some of that's water, too. What yeah. is the breakdown, Mr. Howard? you remember that off the top of your head? It's, yeah, it's 35? Like 30, 32% or something, uh, but it's a state park. I mean, most of it's state park. There's some national uh, as well, but we get that data. Right, and, and something else that we do that I think is unique is we go through, we tag. Well, so I just called my guys this morning, actually. Everyone was in at 7.30 this morning, and, and, and girls, and all just guys. And, uh, and I said, hey, how many parcels? And so you have 142,000 parcels. We're going to look at every single one of those. Because what we want to do is we like to look at many parcels only one time ever, uh, like the state-owned lands. We're going to tag mm -hmm. those. We know those are never going to develop as mm -hmm. houses. Are, and so mm -hmm. we want to pull those out of the available um, uh, bucket of what can be developed. Mm -hmm. um, some consultants will just take and just start planning land uses uh, maybe without looking at those sort of things. We, we completely identify those state-owned lands and pull those away so that we don't forecast growth where growth isn't going to occur, but yet put it where it is going to occur. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Um, and then we have a lot of platted lots, like really large subdivisions mm -hmm. that are very old that didn't completely get built out. So a lot of this we can't really change, which is unfortunate. Um, the couple of big points that I want to make, uh, a prior board got rid of concurrency, and we are desperately behind on infrastructure. And so on some of the big roads that need to be widened and so forth. So if there's anything that we can do, I, I said something about, um, I was quoted in the paper as saying if we could have negotiated voluntary partial concurrency basically from new developers um, that are, are developers that are creating new developments because we would have to bring all of our roads up to a passing grade to be able to bring it back mm -hmm. and we can't afford to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of, that's just one of the um, things that makes, that keeps me up at night. Uh, and then secondly, the growth fears in this county are enormous. There are people that are absolutely celebrating the fact that we have great new retail coming into the middle of the county, and then, but there's a whole lot of folks that moved here saying, well, shut the door behind me now. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm really hoping that having that crystal ball, people don't like uncertainty, and they want to know where things are going to go and how they're going to develop. And I'm really hoping that with that crystal ball, it'll calm a lot of the fears. Well, so this including ours. <laughs> well, it reminds me of the, the work in Charlotte County, where we, you know, again, we like to look to the future, but we also sort of have to study the past. 
Uh, and so we don't really use building permitting, uh, historic permitting, to say, well, this is something you're going to permit in the future. The model is in, independent of all that. But we do like to go back and see where, again, the homes have been built, where areas are, are sort of uh, consistent, mm -hmm. areas that maybe are, are declining because maybe they're approaching build out or, or some other reason, or areas that are really getting ready to take off. Uh, again, you might already know all those areas, but you might not. The data can be very surprising. If you're fearless when you do the approach, uh, some very interesting things can come out of it, and we can help help you and your residents understand uh, this area, it's changing, it's going to change, it's going to change a whole lot, and if you don't like it, then there's policies that we can enact to change those things, or or not. Maybe all the land's already privately owned, and um, you know, again, not sometimes uh, what we find in certain areas, people don't want to hear, but mm -hmm. we're fearless with the data and what we uh, and our findings. So, Yeah, well, I love data, too, so okay. that's this was great. Commissioner Bays, are you ready? Hi. Hi. Um, talking about the Live Local, would this program also help identify what we would consider to be affordable housing? Is it currently inventoried today? Um, that's not part of what I do. I do have... Um, a gentleman, uh, David Boston, Dr. David Boston, that does work, he dig, really digs into the affordable side of things. Um, he actually lives in, in Marion County, and we have uh, partnered up on some things before, so that's someone I could bring in to help analyze. That's really his, his bailiwick is really about the affordability and indexes and those sorts of things. And to tag on to that, I know you talked about um, income. You look at income demographics. And I believe you identified that as earned income demographics. Well, so uh, there's the census publishes several different data sets about incomes. There's personal income. We tend to focus on household income, and we look at how it's changing over time because the more dollars that show up in certain areas, in some areas the, the household income is increasing rapidly, and that gives us areas that are more likely to be able to adopt more commercial, support more commercial uses, whereas areas that are flat or maybe even, even declining, uh, and when they're flat and declining, then we look at why, what's going on. Uh, sometimes it's not what you think. Uh, some very wealthy areas, believe it or not, have very, very low household incomes. Of course, when you're sitting on $20 passive, million. Dollars, passive you, income. Yeah, you don't need to, you don't have any household income, right? Uh, you have the stocks and bonds and such. Right. That was where I was going with that is to understand because we have a large sector of retirees that live here. Um, the more affluent is not going to have earned income. They're going to have the passive income. So that would be interesting to me to know. Um, I, I've had my rant um, many times about the Bieber report. I'm very, very concerned, as um, especially when it comes to water supply. And uh, I don't think that we have, number one, the Bieber report did not anticipate the population on the Suncoast Parkway in the development. And I'm, it's not looking at that, and I don't think that we're taking that into account for water supply needs. And I personally would love to see us uh, take this type of information and be able to go to the district and say, we want our permit for what we're going to look like in 50 years, because we know that externally there are developments that are coming in around us, even though we don't have consumptive rights for water under the ground, but we have people that are looking for us for uh, the public water supply. So I, I I would like to know that we have a certain level of protection for X number of years for that that water supply that we're going to need before letting somebody else pump it a different direction. Um, uh, our, our data is perfect for that. Our data is perfect, but and we and to your point. Um, so we, there's a part of the model called uh, zone sequence data, and we take every zone and we use, we use different factors, and one of the factors we talk about is your proximity to excellent uh, transportation services. The further, you're, if you're in the middle of a cow field, in the middle of nowhere, you have bad uh, transportation access, and so you're less likely to develop them than one that is. Another point we look at is available, availability of water sewer, and, uh, and then other um, uh, uh, convenience factors as well. And so as that parkway is developed, it then changes the sequence 
of development. It's going to now encourage development along that corridor. We can help demonstrate that through hard data and through, of course, a land use analysis of where and when the, that development is likely to occur. So you can then show the district, not just, you know, it's about 10,000. This is exactly where the development is going to occur. And this is the, the resulting need for water and sewer uh, services uh, as a result of that growth. And then as far as future development or redevelopment, do you also work with FEMA on the flood map and knowing exactly uh, anything west of 19 or in that zone with it being high coastal flooding and, you know, what works, what doesn't? We don't work with FEMA, but look at the, the FEMA maps and stuff so that we don't forecast stuff in areas, uh, items in areas that are not likely or not allowed to be developed. Like Charlotte County is a perfect example in their coastal high hazard area. They're trying to do TDRs, remove density from, it's not the beach, but the coastal areas and move it more inland and give them the, the owner a bonus in the process to encourage them to do the right thing to reduce the amount of uh, uh, development and then of course uh, um, evacuation uh, should a storm hit. So we do consider that. We, yeah, we don't work directly for FEMA. Uh, let's see. And it's amazing flood maps are changing locally in our area. There are areas, my house used to be in flood zone X and it didn't sink. But now I'm in uh, AE12. So I went from being a no chance of flooding at all to if uh, I, I need to have flood, I have a mortgage uh, at the tune of three to 4,000 a year and the house, I mean, I'm 12 miles inland, you know, I'm three feet above an old tomato field. Um, we have an area that's pretty far from the Gulf, you know, and uh, we had such epic rains, but it just a, has a lower elevation, and we had such epic rains, and the rain stopped, and then the waters receded, and then they started to come back up because the aquifer was so full, it was actually pushing the water back up in that area. It was crazy. Someone in the audience, I believe, was the author of the quote that said, if you've got um, cypress trees in the yard, don't buy the house <laughs> in the front yard. Well, we do live on an island, and um, <laughs> everybody should probably have flood if you live in Florida, no matter where you live. Um, <clears throat> I know this is probably a way far-fetched question here, but <clears throat> as you're modeling and predicting, does it... Does this give you any insight as to what your population, your new population growth would look like? You know, age, mm -hmm. uh, would we be you know, become a bedroom? Are we gonna be more residential? Are we gonna be a bedroom community for people to live that's going to work externally, you know, north and south or east of us? Um, can th things we can tease out of the data. Uh, if, uh, if you don't have enough uh, non-residential uh, um, building space here, uh, then a, we know for a fact that your, your population, their jobs are not all located in this area, and so in fact they are working somewhere else. We, we can detect those things uh, through the data, uh, and um, when we're done with the population forecast, we, we can then go back to census data and create a strata to tell you where we think the age groups are going to fall. Certainly when we do the, the schools, we look at the percent of school-aged children. And something that we've seen all up and down um, uh, the West Coast and all the way up into Alabama, sort of the same thing. I don't want to get lost in numbers here, but so you have the population. Let's say your population is 100,000. And let's say you have uh, 25,000. Uh, school-aged children in that population. So that means a quarter of your population are school-aged children, SAC as we call them. So that, that, get that, that idea that it's 25%. Well, what we're seeing, uh, so in Auburn, Alabama, just six years ago, their percent of school-aged children was about 12.6%. It's now at 122 And you think, well, that's 1%. It's not that big a deal. Well, it's a huge deal because they've been 20,000 in population. So what's strange, fun way, is their, their, their enrollment is increasing but the percent of school-aged children is actually dropping like a rock. And so if they add, when their population doubles, they don't need twice the number of schools. It's a linear kind of thinking. We specialize in nonlinear thinking. So we're able to show them that, that their, their enrollment's gonna keep growing, but it's growing at a reduced rate. And we actually got into some areas where we noticed that 400 people moved into this zone and their enrollment dropped by 40 from one year to the next. We went back and dug into that, and we found, well, there's apartments moving. Then we actually went to that apartment website, and we said, okay, well, how big is the playground? And it's 
about as big as this dais right here. Well, clearly they're not they're not aiming for kids. I'm gonna look at the gym. The gym is bigger than this chamber. Okay, so they're 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 aiming for adults. That okay, that makes sense. Now we understand why the school age children percent is dropping, and yet the the population is growing in this area. So we can tease things out of the data. That and, and that is very much to the point because the Florida State Chamber would tell you that we were at a thousand people a day moving in, which has now dropped to 700. And what we're seeing is a decline, people moving from our state um, that are families. So the school age children are moving with the families externally out of Florida. So we're bringing more retirees mm -hmm. into the county or right. into the state. So that was what that was where I was going. I mean, are you working kind of with the state, somebody like that that really is digging into those numbers and kind of knowing that you've got we dig into school them. age children leave, leaving? Right. But yeah, so uh, and, and sometimes it's school age children leaving, but sometimes it's not necessarily leaving. It's that the kids are graduating, right? They're they're aging out, and it's just the influx is, is so much greater of the retiree versus the worker bee with with families and, and school age children. So sometimes it's a dilution, right? The, it's not that the school age children are going down, but it's the rest of the population is growing and it's it's pushing down that ratio. Sometimes though it is flat out that the, the families are leaving and because they can't afford it or And I have one last question, my favorite, transportation. Um, so as far as transportation, we know that we, the last seven miles of 491, we need to expand. Uh, we know that it's at some point 41 is going to continue it continue to expand. Um, do you, is that part of your, I, I believe what you said earlier, I mean, you're gonna take those that roads and look at the expansion mm -hmm. of where those roads are going? Yep, and what they mean for the vacant land around them, how, how quickly they're likely to develop. As we increase infrastructure in areas, a, a truism is we tend to see more development re result in, uh, from that. Depending. And, and, right. Because I think that's very important for this county to know exactly uh, where to build roads. You know, there needs to be a rethinking, a retraining of thought because I personally don't like to build a lot of county roads because if you build them, you have to maintain them. Mm -hmm. So being very strategic in where you're going to cross people and get them connected to where they need to go without just overbuilding. I think this is perfect when it comes to your long range transportation plan and working with your MPO. And I believe you said you worked with District 1's mm -hmm. MPO. Many, many of the MPOs, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, like, I would love if you'd work with District 7 because if you look at the influences mm -hmm. of what the Suncoast Parkway is doing to our county, bringing people in, um, it's very concerning on how we will move people because it's going to dump out on 19 as opposed to going anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so it's getting people through our county is going to be problematic. Right. It's been clear, we don't forecast or design where roads are going to go. But we do we do look at where roads are planned or planned to be expanded, and that goes into affecting how we treat the vacant land around those uh, in terms of coding. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate you having us here today. Um, you know, the it's never uh, whoever, whatever, uh, how you choose to move forward. Uh, there's never a better day uh, to start planning than today. You never have more vacant land than you have tonight. And no matter how bad a problem might be right now, um, there are solutions. That and I want to I want to encourage you, whoever you choose, to fearlessly look at those those uh, solutions to meet the challenges that you're having. Uh, because you know the there's the elect the electorate behind you is expecting you to make the decisions that are going to improve their life. You know, I, for what it's worth, uh, I'm ne it was never one of you, but I did serve 11 years as an elected uh, as a special district down in Collier County. So I have had to run for election. I understand uh, when the electorate's not happy with uh, things, um, and going through that, you wear a lot of weight on your shoulders. I I, I respect and understand that, um, but I want to uh, encourage you to. Uh, Keep moving forward, no matter what. Keep moving forward. Thank you for your time, Mr. Farmer. And by the way, begin with the end in mind is my favorite as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anything else, sir? Mr. Howard, do you have anything? 
always say that they're like what you said, hope is not a plan. And what you know, you gotta you, you gotta make better decisions if you had data to make those decisions. And I think uh, you can learn from the history, which what that's what you'd be doing, but also project for the future. Um, and if we're able to at some point bring their firm on, I think uh, we'll join uh, several other counties and communities in Florida that are proactively planning. And I think for the citizens, we, they deserve our best efforts and uh, you no longer can afford to be re reactive. So thank you for coming here um, on your dime, uh, coming to visit with us. So thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Madam Chairman. Yes. Um, Mr. Howard, has any of the previous boards ever brought in a company to do this study? No, no I know definitely that I'm aware of. But I think, you know, this is a, uh, I got to know them actually on a sidebar. I have no affiliation with them, but um, I was asked to consider uh, a county manager position actually with Collier County, actually uh, several couple years back. And when I was, when they were kind of, let me crisscross the county, I met with the chairman and all the commissioners and I asked them about all the growth. They were very concerned about what was going on. And I asked, what are you doing? And they mentioned Metro forecasting. Um, and also, you know, the Florida Association of Counties are very familiar with them. And when I seen the tool they had there, I said, what an opportunity here at some point to have this kind of, it's really cutting edge. You know, so what you're doing is really cutting edge, but uh, like I said, I don't, there's nothing like that that's ever been, you know, done here in Citrus that I've seen. And I think it complements, it doesn't take the place of, you know, growth management and all the great staff we have, but this becomes a tool in your toolbox that you can proactively plan and look at what happened in the past, but also what's going to the future. Um, so it's an amazing, an amazing tool to have that kind of puts you so far advances you where you need to go. So, but I've, I've not seen anything since I've been here. Because um, again, this is really cutting edge, but not only is it cutting edge, it's actually happening. It's not like this is they just decided they'd show up here and they're going to practice on Citrus County. Right. That's not going to happen. Um, we have right. they have the, the the track record, the awards, and and to show this. So this model, like he said, it it's not a cookie cutter approach, but you can utilize their systems with any type of city county you know application. Well, thank you for bringing this to us. I think it's um, never been a big fan of studies and because a lot of times uh, boards don't, they pay for a study and then they don't even follow the advice. But this, to me, is invaluable. And yeah. I really appreciate you bringing this forward. And two more points. We actually currently have a vacant, funded, long-range planner position, which is very difficult, you know, to, to get those positions or challenging. So this, I almost see this as augmenting that. Like I said, you have funding available. So this is almost like you're augmenting that specialty um, is what you're doing. As a result, if you could bring this type of talent on board, that of course he's got a team. Well, we could never afford that team, you know, as an employee. But you have all those. You get multiple tools in that toolbox. Thank you. Board, anything else? All right. Then um, open to the public. Would anyone like to speak on the subject matter at hand? <laughs> get three minutes unless there is a letter on file, in which case please let us know and you'll get five and be sure and fill out a green card either before or after you speak and give it to the clerk. BJ Offhammer, I have a letter on file. I'm not going to utilize it because I'm probably going to piss some of you off. Um, I worked in, in city government um, as a career. Um, I lived as a multi-generational Floridian in uh, you know, South Florida. I am horrified that we could would consider anything from Collier County as anything that we want to be. Um, I grew up going into those areas. We had property in those areas. I spent time there. It's it's a horrific place to be. My best friend lives in Charlotte County. I've seen the growth that they've had, and it is not what we want to be. We are, and I continually say this, special. We are not like other counties. We should not keep trying to be like other counties. This sounds like we're starting over and trying to create cities throughout the county. That is not who we are. We are the nature coast, our mission to manage growth and foster prosperity by prioritizing the protection of environmental assets. I see nothing here about the environment taking protections. I see nothing about modeling. I see nothing about modeling for the agriculture, the M&B dairies, our local community, people who do good things. That's Florida. I see nothing about the water uses, the spring shed. Tuscany Ranch that you guys are going to talk about soon is in the middle of the B map for, for Kings Bay. 
we don't talk about the water uses. You're talking about trying to have water uses in the future. Well, what about all the water uses for everything that we have already approved now? You know, it's nice that you have the thing on the website where I can look and I can see what's been approved going forward, but show me a rolling tally of what we've already obligated ourselves to being to providing for all of these applications. Homes, businesses, developments. Show me the application. Show me how much water we are going to use. Water is finite in this state. We can, we can get a, a, a larger, you know, pull um, permit. That doesn't mean the water's there. I mean, all the surrounding communities in Florida as a whole, it's incredible the growth that's going on. We do not have the resources. We just don't. We're at a deficit for infrastructure here now. We don't have firefighters to go to the national standard for staffing what we have. Forget having equipment. We don't have the people. We don't have the deputies. So talking about going forward, let's fix what we've got first. Please, God. And now the last thing that's probably going to make you mad is it's irresponsible to say that we have 50% in, in things that won't be developed by talking about state lands that we have no control over. That's like saying, well, Sumter County has got a water theme park. So, you know, we're going to just use that. It's not our property. We need to talk about green spaces in Citrus County that we control, and we don't have enough of them. We don't have enough parks. We don't have enough schools. Take this stuff into consideration, please. I mean, so many of us love our, our county, and we want it to be a happy, healthy environment for future generations. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Robin Orlandi. Uh, Tricia said a lot of what I was about to say, but as everyone quoted, begin with the end in mind. And I think what you need to think about is in 2070, what do you want Citrus County to look like? What do you want to leave to your children and the young generations we're hoping to grow up here? Do we want to look like Pinellas County or Collier County with that level of build out? Or as the Metro uh, planner said, you know, build out population can change based on policy and allocation of density. I th think that that's what we need to be thinking about, planned development. Development's going to come. I sent each of you a letter from Thousand Friends of Florida. You're probably already familiar with that group. But some of their imagining is for higher density that's more concentrated, leaving open public mm -hmm. lands, conservation lands available. And we talk about those lands as if, well, people only, a few people use them or, um, or they're maybe recreational use, but, but the piece that's missing in the metrics that were presented is the value of natural services. Fresh water, the oxygen we breathe isn't created by concrete. It's created by trees, plants, all that complex biology that you would need a subject matter expert to explain why it's valuable. But there are planners that put an economic value on nature services. It's part of what a thousand friends is pursuing. You need to bring those metrics into the equation because we are rich in that now. But if we develop without good oversight and good planning, we're going to give those services up. And again, to the point, the water on this planet is not infinite. It's a finite quantity. Google it, look online, talk to whoever you want on, on either side of the spectrum. Republicans, developers, business people, conservationists, tree huggers, liberals. Water resources are declining globally. We're blessed with an abundance. We need to conserve that by every means necessary. And when you're told that, you know, well, the lagoon at Tuscany Ridge, it's, you know, it's going to be filled with water and then it'll be fine. It uses less than a golf course except it evaporates. It is going to be a continuous draw. And when you add up all the millions of gallons daily that are going to be used by the suite of developments already on the books, that's a big draw on the aquifer. And I know Swift Mud says, oh, don't worry, there's plenty of water. But if you look at spring flows around the state, 30% reductions. 
There's springs up in the northern panhandle that are no longer flowing that used to be spas. They used to be tourist attractions. Not anymore. You've heard me say before I came from the Keys, those beautiful waters, the fish are swimming in circles down there now because they pushed tourism. They made a great economic Thank you. Success. I'm sorry. I know. Thank they, you. They, they, got what, they got the money in the tax base, but they're losing the environment. Please keep that in consideration. And thank you all. Thank you. Ma'am. You... Good morning. Karen Esty. Um, again, um, the two girls, the ladies who spoke before me, have really said a lot. But I think we're leaving out, and, and it's extremely important that our economy in this county is water-based, all of it whether we have recreational space, we have fishing space, everything is dependent on that central ridge where our watershed is. And again, it is not infinite. We just can't keep uh, uh, building over it, making impermeable spaces there. In addition, uh, we have, where we came from in the Redland, we protected agriculture like with a vengeance. That's where our food comes from, that's where jobs come from. It's a huge, huge billion dollar industry. We cannot allow industry to build up to agriculture and impact them to where they say, well, we can't do business because our neighbor's saying it smells. We have workers in there. The other thing is, you're absolutely correct, is to bring back concurrency. It is a must because that is a stop. It's like a gate saying, okay, before we can go further, uh, on our county roads, or even our, well, the state kind of monitors their own roads, we can't do this anymore because we're, we're at RDF, just like 41 and other some of the roads here in the county. The other item that um, we don't talk about our ecosystem, and again, Tricia was right, our forests are state owned. If they want to come in and cut it in half, that's up to them. We have no say in that. So we can't say never say never when it comes to land use. You have big industrial areas in this county that's under underutilized, like Holder. That's a whole square mile of space, of land that's not even be remotely utilized now. All of these things need to be plugged in as to what we have now, what is needed, and, and we're just avoiding everything. Schools, fire, police, all of these things. The schools right now are mainly built on like 10 acre parcels. They're going to need more than that in the future. Do we have land for them, for student capacity? And I agree, we are a very special county. We need to, to treat this county as it is extremely special. When I first came here and I talked to some of the commissioners, I said, you know what you need to do? Get a map of the county and figure out, this is in 2012. Get a map, put it up in your count, put it up wherever you can, take a look at it every day. Where do you want development to go? So here we are today in a planning phase, and it's 2024. So we've lost all of those years of really correct planning on how we can make the county better for tourism, because we are really tourism-based. We don't need all of these car washes and, 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 and other things. It's just, it's, it's just ridiculous, and all of you all know that. And you know I've written in the paper, and you're probably saying, you know, I just wish you would go away. But nonetheless, it's important to really pay attention to what, um, and don't make us like other counties, please. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Janet Barrick, Citrus Springs. Everybody keeps saying the same sentence, okay? Begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. We are the nature coast. That's what everybody keeps saying. That's what everybody wants. You talk to the residents. They don't want massive, massive growth. They want to stay the nature coast. Our tourism. We got the ocean. We want scallops. We want to be able to go out and do this and that and the other on the Gulf. OK, so the thing is, when we start looking at these things, we had a department, growth management. Years ago, when I started coming to these, there was a very nice lady that was in charge, but we had a master plan. We had a comp plan. Every once in a while, the board would adjust a little bit here and there because of future growth. They made 
little bit of land on 44, and they were smart. They watched ahead. They were proactive, and they figured out where the gas stations were going to need on 44 for letting off from the Veterans Parkway. And a lot of you see that. They were proactive, but they weren't aggressive. To me, this is an aggressive move. We do not need to be spending money when we have in-house people that are trained, that that's what their job is to do, protect our growth, protect the development, make sure that our developers are doing what we, the county, are asking, what the people are asking, OK? Um, I've seen a lot of different things, and we need to stick to the previous plans that the previous boards talked, the previous boards talked. Rebecca knows some of these plans because she was there. Commissioner Kennard knows some of these plans because he was there. They were very, very slow moving, but they were productive because they were looking ahead. The school system has their own plans. And I know I've, I've gone to meetings with them, and I don't get to go to many of them, but I do know that they have plans. But some of their plans are now being a little skewed because of the population. Citrus Springs population has taken off. Pine Ridge has not. Citrus Springs school system, our students in Citrus Springs are going to be all rezoned because there are too many students. There's like 102% is the number of students at the one elementary school. All right, so Pine Ridge was going to be where the next schools were going to be built, but now they're starting to reconsider because they do have the land. But they do have the land already set aside. The schools were planned. Okay, they have this land in Citrus Springs already set aside. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wooten. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Um, name, I had name, a column. Name for the record. <laughs> Josh Wooten, President and CEO of the Citrus County Chamber of Commerce. I did a column this weekend, and I was kind of nice to y'all. Are you, do you have five minutes or three minutes? I, I can probably do it before five, but go ahead and set the timer so I don't go over. Um, so I did a column over the weekend. I don't know if you read it, but I was saying that y'all were trying to get it right. I mean, we're in a massive growth spurt. Um, when I was on the board, we had a, a huge growth spurt as well. Um, and, you know, the ebbs and flows, but we're in a massive growth spurt right now. And um, I think that this is a actually a good tool. I mean, there must be some disconnect here because I'm hearing what you are trying to accomplish is to plan what we need in 5, 10, 15, 30 years. Where would the fire stations be? How many schools would we need? Knowing what you know, which is we have 57,000 lots that can I presumably go pull a permit tomorrow and build. You know that. Um, but what you don't know is where the fire stations need to go, where the schools are going to be. Are those 57,000 lots? I mean, should some of that be neighborhood commercial? Um, you know, we talk about industrial. People were against the 550 acres in Holder, and now it's being held up as a model of good planning. Um, people were against the um, 80 acres in Inverness, and uh, as an industrial park, and now it's being held up as a model by the whole state of a nice pocket park for industrial use. So I look at this as y'all trying to, um, to once again get it right. There was a, this, my favorite slide that he showed was the bumper to bumper traffic and the, and the dust wheel running down Main Street. And where I think most people are is in the middle of that. We know we're going to grow. I know I'm so happy Commissioner Bates mentioned the Florida Chamber and the um, the map that mm -hmm. they they publish and they spend millions of dollars um, with things. They they told us how many jobs we need by 2030. They mm -hmm. told us what our population is going to be in 2030, how many students we're going to have in 2030, and they set a roadmap to get there. It's not as pinpointed as theirs. And they, they're not going to tell us where all the amenities need to be. So to deny that we're going to grow um, would be irresponsible. It would be malpractice. And 
I've never heard anybody say we're, we're going to um, set as a goal to be like Collier County. I heard him say he worked for Collier County and this is some of the things they identified. Y'all are the final arbiters of, of what this county looks like. He's just gonna give you the roadmap and the tools to help you get there. So I applaud you. We got your back on this type of stuff. I'm sure whatever the cost is, you can spread it against, against many different entities, like Craig Stevens can pay for the fire station for it, schools can pay for that. So it should not be really a financial issue, uh, but it is campaign season and it takes courage sometimes to do the right thing. So please um, continue moving forward, continue trying to get it just right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wooten. Good morning, I'm Diane South, 5530 North Elkham Boulevard in Pine Ridge. I have a few questions that I realize probably won't be answered, but these are just things that have come to my mind. Um, have you as a board, and first of all, thank you for all that you do. I know it's not an easy position to be in, I know that. Um, have you visited other communities or counties that have used David services? I, like to know that, doesn't need to be answered right now. Also, the fact that um, I'm truly concerned about transportation, recreation into our area. I look at Punta Gorda, Charlotte County, as one of the larger examples used today. And Charlotte County is what Punta Gorda was 30 years ago. And I have lived in that area, and I don't want to be living in Punta Gorda 30 years from now, if I'm alive back in that time. But I also want to talk a little bit about Punta Gorda, because the transportation, the roads are horrendous. When you look at Vermont Road, which goes out to, I can't think of the name of the development that goes out there, it's two lanes. The traffic is horrendous. There are large uh, concrete trucks that are continually on that road. You look at 41 or Tamiami Trail that goes through town, it is a complete mess. It's a hot mess. Particularly, um, uh, Allegiant Airlines has their resort there, Sun Seekers, and that's a gigantic resort. And here you're basically on a six lane highway and traffic is continually backed up. And these are, these are huge issues that I see in that area. And I'm sorry, it was Babcock Ranch. Um, so I don't know what we're going to do with traffic. Um, and I also bring this up because we have um, Tuscany Ranch. I'd like to know if the communities that are somewhat being proposed are going to be a part of that study. If we use that service, okay, very good. And I'm just, I'm just real concerned about growth. I know we're gonna have growth, and I know that we need to manage. And my favorite saying is failing to plan is planning to fail, and I know we need to do that. So I thank you for your time. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the board? Seeing none, um, I would say that uh, I, I'm gonna address the first three speakers specifically. I think you're conflating, as Mr. Wooten sort of intimated, you're conflating tools with results and what we're trying to build. Um, I'm certainly not angry. Um, it takes a lot to make me mad. I am dismayed, however, because I was the architect of the county's first strategic plan that was specifically citizen-led, which according to the facilitators was a complete anomaly. Normally the county commission gets together and decides what the strategic plan is for their county. In this regard, we actually uh, went out to the public and had the, the public devise the citizen, the, what they wanted for a strategic plan. From that is our tagline where nature and community thrive. I am a scuba diver, I'm an avid recycler, I am very much into uh, protecting the nature coast and the environment. So speaking for myself, I cannot obviously speak for the rest of the board members, 
but I would like to use this tool to devise a future that is very uh, perfectly Citrus County and what we find special. So in any regard, um, and as far as it being irresponsible to say that the state forest can never be developed, I, I definitely trust the state to keep hold of that forest land more than I do future commissions to take care of county land. So, you know, um, things change, um, but I would definitely bank on, at least in our lifetimes, that state forest never shrinking an inch. Board, would anyone else like to comment? I have. Uh, well, ahead. Commissioner Kennard, then Commissioner Schleybaugh. Yeah, I'll go ahead and chime in. Uh, our last speaker stole uh, stole my thunder a little bit because that, that was, I was going to remind uh, the board and those uh, watching at home or here that uh, certainly failing to plan is planning to fail. And this isn't anything that's going to replace, I don't believe, uh, what we already have, but it's an additional tool uh, from an organization that has a track record. Now, whether or not those communities utilize that tool and built the roads out as they should or budgeted as they should have, that's a whole different argument. That's on the local officials. Uh, but if they provided if they provided the data and said at at this point in time, Tammy Amy Trail needs to be this wide, needs to have this capacity because this is the population that you're going to have out there. Here's the tool. Now it would be up to future boards here to do something with that information. It'd be up to us to act on what we're able to act on. Uh, but I believe this is this is producing a a very very valuable tool not only for this board but for future boards uh, to be able to to plan and prepare for the growth that's coming. Uh, I think most, if not all, the public speakers or Folks that I have heard out in the public have said, you can't stop the growth. That's exactly right. We are going to grow. We're either going to plan appropriately and build out uh, infrastructure appropriately or we're not. Uh, for those that, uh, you know, the certainly the critics that are out there um, suggesting that infrastructure is not being built out, uh, they're simply not paying attention to what's going on around them. So a tremendous amount of infrastructure projects underway already. Does there need to be more? Yes, there absolutely does need to be more. And I think that's something that this board has been keenly aware of and that we are addressing. So that's all. Thank you. Commissioner Schleybaugh. Thank you. Ladies, thank you. I appreciate everything you said. Um, I've said it before, native born Floridian, both my husband and I, my daughters, and uh, I grew up in Sarasota County. I was born and raised in Sarasota County. Um, they can't fit one more person there. And so when we moved up here 28 years ago, um, the first thing my husband and I did as soon as we could afford it is we bought 62 acres in the center of the county that is still ag land 20 years later. And we did that because we wanted to hold on to a bit of Florida. We didn't expect the county to do that for us. And I was afraid that it was gonna get so built up that we, we wanted to just grab onto a piece of land. And it's still that. I can't tell you how many times, right there in 491 and 486, we get offered money for it. And, I, and I've said to every developer, you know, that's gonna be our daughter's decision, that that land's gonna stay like it is you know, as, as long as I can. In fact, my daughter's calling me right now. Um, <laughs> but um, she probably wants to sell the land. But um, I just think that the reason why I got so excited about this presentation is because this is an opportunity for us to do it right. And I think that by, you know, that's why I asked, has a previous board ever done this? Because I feel like so much of our county is hodgepodge. And Again, I'm gonna say it, the gas station and the car washes and the storage units, I can't, I can't take it. And so, you know, I got the answer. They haven't done this before. So I think you're looking at it oh, like we're planning to develop it. I'm personally looking at it, how do we plan for all the residents and the businesses coming to us that we can preserve a green space and that we can have, 
you know, hospitals that are convenient for our citizens and they can stay within that five mile radius and, and not have to go all over the county and, and, you know, just planning for our future. So we need to get ahead of development. We have to. Went round and round last two, two weeks ago about, I felt that a permit was too intensive. It, it passed, I'm one vote. I think we all are cognizant of development and getting it right. So I, I just wanna keep saying that, that this board is trying to get it right. Um, I live in a district that actually is the only district that doesn't have any water. So to me, my district is primed for what we need to have developed for our county. It's the center of the county and let's get it right. Um, we also have reached a milestone in Florida. They, as of today, there's been 100,000 acres preserved in the state of Florida, ag land. Um, this is a significant momentum in land conservation. Without farmers, we're not gonna last. So um, that's my heart. I'm telling you, this is where I'm coming from. Um, there was a question asked if um, I've ever visited any of the counties that you have been a part of. I don't think you're to blame for Sarasota County. <laughs> I think they should have planned 30 years ago when it took me 45 minutes to get from Fruitville to downtown to work. 30 years ago, it took me 45 minutes to go less than eight miles. So um, I've been to Sarasota County, Manatee County, Charlotte County, and probably a couple other. I didn't see what other counties, so. Um, and then I'm gonna disagree with my the, the chairman. Um, I'm very nervous about the state forest. I don't trust government, even though I'm in government. I think that at any time that 32% could be taken away. I do trust our ag commissioner right now, and I know that he wants to preserve as much state land and agricultural land as we can, but who knows who comes in afterwards. So. You know, I, I, I have to agree with you on that. So the, I'm always a little nervous when it says, oh, we have this much in concert, you know, protected land. But um, hopefully by doing this plan, future boards can follow it. And that's what I'm excited about. So thank you for coming today and taking the time. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Madam Chairman. Commissioner Bays. Well, as they say, the devil's always in the detail, and this is how I think we get to the detail. There's certain um, developments that are just going to happen by right, um, and I think this is going to help us plan. I specifically like this because <laughs> you've heard me say over and over and over, how in the world can we budget if we don't know the roadmap of where things are going? And I think this, um, this will help us devise a financial plan uh, we can prepare, we can look five years into the future and know how many uh, residential units are coming on, we'll know commercial units that are coming on, we'll have some sense of idea of what our budget's going to look like and how we're going to finance the future of the things that we are going to need. But to do this, we're just, I always say it, we're shooting arrows in the dark somewhat because we really don't have a handle financially of what we need and where we're going. And this this truly gives us an opportunity to um, right that ship and give us some, some foresight into the future. Uh, I hear what you're saying, but I, I, I did not take this presentation to say we're gonna look like something. What I took from this is to say, this is what we don't wanna look like and let's plan and, and make Citrus County the nature coast. It helps us get to where we wanna go and not have mistakes made that other counties have made in the past. So I see it differently. I support this. I think it will help us on many fronts and um, I'm excited to get started. Thank you. Commissioner Fennigan. Thank you. Um, just to alleviate maybe some of the fears because I understand what you're saying and I think that um, maybe it wasn't understood, PJ, what you were saying when you said it's irresponsible to always say that we can't build in the state forest. I know what you're saying because it's like we can't make that our green space. We have, that's not our land. So we need to make the rest of it not build every square inch. 
But when I hear the presentation, I think you're hearing development, development. I'm hearing balance. Uh, the presenter made a good point when he said, you know, this is substantial, um, comprehensive information because we need that to say no maybe to some very intensive developments or something that we may not want here. So I think the instructions we can give is not, hey, see how many people we can get here in the next 30 years and see what we can develop. We want to say, who's who do you think is coming here? How do we keep this the nature coast? So I'm seeing balance from this because right now, if we don't do something uh, by right, people could could be nilly willy, um, for lack of a more professional term. And what we're going to do is say, no, we want this to look like the nature coast. We want to preserve water. Uh, we want to preserve our way of life. But you know, people are coming here, so where do we put them? And then how do we make? How do we keep them from driving across town so that we don't have traffic and construction so that we can have the nature coast? So what I'm hearing is balance and an opportunity to say no for all of these comprehensive land changes that may not be in the best interest of our county for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further from the board? Mr. Howard? David, how long have you worked for Charlotte County? We started, we started actively working for them in, uh, I think it was May of last year. That's what I thought. I just <laughs> want to make sure. I, that's an area I know very well, actually. Um, uh, you know, my first job out of high school was with, with the city of Ponte Gorda. Um, I was born in that area, so I know those roads, what they look like decades ago. Not a lot has changed, so I want to make sure Dave is not blamed for his planning efforts. He just started basically or trying to help with the sins of the past, you know, kind of helping that community. Just so I want to make sure that the public that's listening to this, this isn't, as a, is based on your recommendations from the past of how congested if Tammy Trail is or our uh, burnt store, all those things. I know those roads very well because that's where I was born and raised early on. Thank you. Right. Well, so uh, I will tell you this, that we're going to be, I'm going to be going back and speaking on May 22nd. Uh, Charlotte wants to actually change, I'm not saying what's wrong, but they, they want to change the way they're doing things. And so they're bringing me back to give the same presentation I gave to their board to 220 of their department heads and managers so that everyone's on the same page and knows what's happening because they, um, they want to make adjustments in the way they're doing things, and it's largely based on our work. Yeah, so. I, mean, I want to go on a different trajectory. So I just want to make sure for clarification, you've only been working with them, you know, less than two years. You know. Right. In our model, is you, uh, Commissioner uh, Finnegan, Fine, Finnegan, Finnegan, uh, Finnegan. Uh, to your comment, it, the, you, I forgot to say the model is it is about balance. Uh, it's not a pro-growth model, but it does it models the policies and and to those looking for, well, what about all the projects you already approved? Every project that's ever been approved goes into the model. Every single parcel, its development potential from the past, the present, and the future goes into the model. And then the model just tells us, okay, well, but based on those policies, what comes out of it? So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farmer. Appreciate it. All right, is there anything further? Okay, we are adjourned, and we will reconvene in um, five minutes. Does that work? <laughs>